Jennifer. Thank you. I'd like to begin by apologizing for my voice. Um, so you're getting, I don't smoke, uh, although it sounds like I smoke a lot, so I apologize now for, for that. It's actually improved considerably since yesterday, so I, I was afraid I'd have to make Adam read it. So uh, thank you for, uh, for tolerating my scratchy voice. Um, over the last two days, we've heard discussion of the chronology and significance of many sites in the Eastern Desert, uh, which have, bear, have borne light on the, <clears throat> brought light to questions of trade, economy, and cultural identity in the Ptolemaic and Roman periods. And underlying each of these narratives, uh, for better or worse, and certainly some might say worse, is a matrix of data that's almost entirely made up of the lowly potsherd. Even the ostracon, before it was an ostracon, uh, it was something more interesting. Uh, it became, before it became something more interesting, was a potsherd, after all. Pottery is our most ubiquitous testament to the activities taking place in the region and remains a critical tool for accessing the date and functionality of a given site. Therefore, the refinement of our understanding of the pottery corpus for the Ptolemaic and Roman periods remains a key goal for archaeology in this region since we often rely upon it not only to date our sites, but also to illuminate the connections between the Eastern Desert and distant lands and perhaps most important of all, to tell us about the life ways of the individuals living, working, and dying in the region. So today, my aim is to shine a little bit of light on the state of Ptolemaic pottery studies in the Eastern Desert by giving an overview of the results of two separate projects. The first I'll discuss is the now completed analysis of the Ptolemaic pottery collected by survey teams working in the region south of the Wadi Hamamat and north of the uh, parallel running from Aswan roughly to Berenike. These wide-ranging surveys have produced important, an important chronological narrative for Ptolemaic activity in the region that has largely set the agenda for further work on questions of chronology, at least from the point of view of the pottery. The second project that I'll briefly discuss are the Ifao excavations at Bir Samud, about which we've heard some details yesterday from various colleagues. Uh, the pottery from Bir Samud is a rich and very exciting corpus of material that informs our understanding not only of the economic and military history of the region in the Ptolemaic era, but also more broadly, the material preferences and cultural expressions of Egyptians and immigrant Greeks living in this very multicultural site. It's an exciting complement to the more general but no less important observations which can be derived from the survey pottery. Archaeological surveys were carried out by a joint University of Michigan and Osseut University team in 1988, 1991, and 1993 as a sidebar to their excavations at Koptos. While teams under the direction of Stephen Sidebotham have periodically worked in this area uh, for 30 years at this point, uh, often in conjunction with their work at Berenike and sometimes in freestanding survey expeditions. The results of these surveys are the documentation of around 90 sites of Ptolemaic or Roman date, or both in some cases, which were identified along the routes, which we've had, heard much discussed, between Berenike, Edfu, and Koptos, and another, which is not mentioned in the ancient sources, which connects uh, the area roughly uh, of Marsinakari uh, on the coast and Edfu. Potteries from these surveys indicate that of the 90 sites in the survey area, 32 have Ptolemaic pottery present on the surface. In my study of this pottery, I've observed several phases in this surface material. The phasing, as laid out in this uh, very general table, of course, reflects the limitations of the comparando, which are available to identify and date this material. And it's a general co comment on uh, the state of Ptolemaic pottery studies generally. In many cases, it's simply not possible to offer more specific dates, dates for shapes and fabrics um, than in this kind of broad brush categorization, um, which I give you here, and I'll return to this figure in, in a moment. Um, a good example of this is the so-called Egyptian amphora type one, which is the earliest amphora form produced in the Ptolemaic period in Egypt. It's roughly derived from imitations of Aegean imports um, of, of various kinds, but it takes on a shape and morphological characteristics which are specific to the type. It becomes something else uh, entirely. And at the moment, this form, which is ubiquitous on sites in the survey area, can only be dated from the early third into the early second century BC, and we can be no more specific than that. In many cases, the survey pottery presented a profile 
with just this kind of general dating because it lacks the direct association with other material that might help narrow, us, narrow down this broad phasing. In essence, because of the compacted nature of these survey collections, uh, we lack the stratigraphic, um, stratigraphic context and the relationships which it gives to further, uh, further narrow our dating profile of these sites. Now, of the, the phases which I've, uh, which I've identified in the survey pottery, the first uh, is one which I think roughly dates from the mid-sixth at the earliest to the mid-fourth centuries BCE. And pottery from this phase appears at five sites in the survey area, including three gold mines at Birsamut, or at North Samut rather, uh, Baramea, and Sukri, where these materials are clearly quite closely related to the late period assemblages at Elephantine in particular. Now, interestingly, many of these same sites also have uh, phases which date to my second uh, periodization, um, which is uh, essentially the late fourth century BC. And given what I now know from Samut North, I think I would probably collapse these two phases into a single phase uh, and assign them all a late fourth century date, um, possibly slightly earlier. Uh, and this is something to maybe be discussed further in the, in the questions. Um, but the forms themselves, the intrinsic evidence of these freestanding pieces, uh, don't actually require that narrow date. Uh, many of them are late period forms which could easily fall into the fifth century and certainly do uh, at places like Elephantini. Now most of the vessels dating to phases one and two, so this sort of broad late period and late fourth century BC phase, they are mostly amphora and large basins, craters, and denoi. Uh, and the presence of amphoras is characteristic of almost all of these Eastern Desert Survey assemblages. Uh, and it's, the, the assemblage as a whole is really dominated by these large transport and utilitarian shapes. There are very few tablewares in these, early two, these first two phases. Uh, and it's possible that the predominance of these large vessels at mining sites, for example, may have something to do with their role in the activities which are taking place there. Um, or from the supply networks which uh, facilitated the work at these mines. On um, this material, for example, is from Sukhari, which is a gold mine uh, along the Marsanakari Road close to, uh, uh, close to the coast. It may also have something to do with the biases of the collection strategy, which uh, was sort of haphazard, I think is probably a fair way to say. Uh, for most of these survey sites, the Michigan and Delaware teams worked quite differently uh, from site to site and certainly between the surveys. And that's no, uh, no uh, sort of condemnation, it's simply the way that survey in these kinds of environments happens. But it certainly introduces a bias towards large, well-preserved uh, amphora rims and other kinds of large vessels. Um, at this point, I think it's probably useful for me to describe uh, broadly what the uh, assemblage of the Eastern Desert Survey pottery looks like for the phases beginning in the third century and running through the first centuries BC, because in general, the, the, the collections indicate a kind of stable profile uh, for the kinds of things which are uh, present on all of these sites. The corpus of forms and in general, the fabrics remain pretty uniform throughout, and it becomes simply a question of presence or absence of certain kind of materials on each site or slight variations in form which indic indicate a different chronological date. So as in phases one and two, uh, the third, second, and first century BC pottery on these sites uh, is uh, heavily biased towards amphora. But we have the introduction of a new type of transport, transport jar, the keg, uh, which is, uh, we have an example shown here from Samut North uh, from the survey of that site. And these appear at slightly more than half of the survey sites, these Ptolemaic sites, which uh, are in, appear in the survey. From the third century on, tablewares become much more common, but they're limited in the repertoire. We see simply incurved rim bowls, a few saucers and plates, uh, and we have very few of the kind of personal vessels which might suggest uh, uh, more um, uh, kind of not this utilitarian function which most of the other pottery suggests. Cooking vessels, interestingly, are, are very infrequent in the survey pottery, and many of these Ptolemaic sites have no cooking vessels on the surface at all, uh, which is an interesting, again, bias in the data, I suspect, uh, but it is what it is. Um, but certainly the overall impression that one receives from these Ptolemaic desert assemblages is one reflecting the practical needs of travelers and these temporary dwellers in the desert for whom the preservation and movement of commodities would have been a priority um, far above any kind of uh, fancy table settings. 
The range of fabrics and wares present in the desert is by most standards very limited. Uh, imports are quite rare, uh, but the remoteness and relative poverty of most of these sites hardly makes this a surpri surprise. The vast majority of the pottery is produced in Egypt and primarily in a calcareous marl fabric, although we do see uh, certain forms appearing in uh, Nile silts. Um, the uniformity of many of these fabrics and the survey context makes it hard uh, to associate any of these vessels with specific production centers, uh, but I think we can easily and certainly without any kind of stretch uh, describe these, this uh, assemblage as really being cl most closely related to upper Egyptian production spheres, particularly the material uh, which has been excavated at Koptos and Elephantini and Edfu and to a lesser extent to Karnak. Okay, so now moving back to the chronology, very briefly, of, these, uh, of the survey. For the third century, so this period of the third into the second centuries, we have 24 sites uh, which are online, so to speak, have activities going on. Unfortunately, the assemblages that we have to work with, these excavated uh, comparanda, do not allow us to actually break out uh, any kind of dating gradations for this very large 150-year period. So accordingly, we lose in the survey data the ability to see fluctuations of settlement patterns between the reigns of Ptolemy II and Ptolemy IV. Uh, and that's something I'll come back to in a moment in the context of Bir Samut. So in this phase, uh, the pottery corpus expands quite a, a bit in, the term, uh, in terms of the fabrics that we see. Um, we have the same profile, which I've already described, of large transport jars with an upper Egyptian orientation. But we have this new addition uh, in the third century, which is the presence of uh, relatively large numbers of kegs which are being produced in the western oases, most likely in Dakhla. Certainly the pottery suggests a Dakhla, uh, Dakhla production site. Um, and this is an unusual uh, situation in the sense that we have not, uh, up until this point, had a good documented uh, evidence for the tr connection and supply of pottery into the eastern desert from the western desert. But I think it's quite clear now that this was one of the major supply routes for this particular kind of jar. We do have Nile silt kegs, but the Dakhla, uh, Dakhla kegs are quite common uh, in this assemblage, particularly in the third century. In other respects, the corpus is relatively uniform from site to site and follows the patterns that I've, already, uh, that I've already outlined. And this is certainly the period where we see the largest number of sites occupied and the largest quantity of material. So the intensity of occupation at these sites, as documented by the survey, is, is at its peak in the, this third into the second century uh, phase. The augmentation of the gold mining, the establishment of the ports, uh, the elephant hunts, all of these can be associated, of course, with the third century. So it's reasonable, I think, to see this uh, uptick in the quantity of material which is uh, present in the desert as uh, reflecting these activities and being linked to them. Uh, and it really is a phase, kind of a boom town, I think, if you can ever call it that, in the Ptolemaic period, the, certainly the third century is it. Uh, and indeed, the, the foundation of the mines and the exploitation and intensive exploitation of the mines must also be a very significant factor in this. Uh, in, in this. And we see also, again, these expansions of the networks which are supplying the eastern desert from the view of the pottery as a significant aspect of this expansion as well. Now, uh, the third and first half of the second centuries uh, are very busy, as I've said. But after 150, things seem to change pretty radically. Between 150 and 100, we have three sites which are abandoned in this period, so reducing our number of active sites by three. Uh, and then certainly by the mid first, in the early to mid first centuries BC, an additional 20 sites uh, are, uh, are taken away, sort of removed from our active sphere. So that by the first century BC, certainly in the middle of it, uh, we have a, not an abandonment, but certainly a reorientation of use of many of these sites. There's still Ptolemaic activity happening. People are still moving around in the desert, but the distribution of those activities is quite different. Um, and this is just to give you uh, an overview briefly, of, of course, of a much more detailed uh, picture, which I could discuss, of the sites which remain in use in the early to mid first centuries BC. But certainly the intensity has dialed much back, and there are many reasons that we could, uh, could, could speculate which would be related to that. 
Um, certainly at the end of the first century BC, we see a number of the sites which had been active in the Ptolemaic period coming back online, and I think this has to do with the intensity of the re-exploration of this region under the, the, after the Roman conquest. Uh, so we see a, a, a kind of swing back towards this intensity which marked the third century, and certainly the first century AD uh, looks very similar in the kind of intensity, although the location of site, m most of the site activity is quite different. Okay, so um, I think it's, uh, at this point, it probably makes sense to move from that very broad picture about which I could say more uh, to discuss some of our more recent developments, the survey pottery. Uh, it's the nature of these survey collections, of course, that are, they're able to give us this very broad snapshot of, uh, of a site's chronology, as well as some ideas about the range of types that are present. But we're not really able to use this kind of collection to develop our sense of, uh, of an assembly for any given period. For that, we really require stratified deposits of material in association with other well-dated pottery forms or other datum, datable material, such as coins or ostraca. And until very recently, very recently, the only comparanda that was available for the Eastern Desert that met these requirements, intact, well-documented stratified material from the Ptolemaic era, came from, a, from very far away in the delta, uh, in, in some cases in the Nile Valley, places like Coptos. But from the desert itself, we had only uh, a very uh, limited collection of material, third century material, which had been excavated from Berenike. We simply had no primary deposits from the desert itself that dated to the Ptolemaic period. And that, of course, now has changed. Thankfully, I'm happy to report. So as Bélanger discussed yesterday, the goals for the Bir Samut project have been to explore the lifeways in the Eastern Desert in the Ptolemaic period, and in particular, the relationship between the economic interests of the Ptolemies, especially the mines that Thomas discussed, and the infrastructure of these desert roads. Beyond economy, however, we're also hoping to develop more refined tools for dating activity in the region, and this through the analysis of these stratified deposits of pottery and other, other artifacts. We also have questions about the specific character of Ptolemaic building in the region, as well as the relationship between the travelers in the desert and the indigenous peoples of the region, who are likely to figure quite prominently in the area, but are almost entirely absent from the historical record. And pottery obviously has an important role to play in addressing each of these questions. Now, during the 2014 season, most of the team's resources were focused on the site of Samut North, which had been damaged in late 2013 by bulldozing and was under ongoing and still imminent threat of development by an Egyptian mining company. Now, the pottery from uh, these buildings, and you see both of the sites here, uh, from North Samut are being uh, studied and published by Jean-Pierre, who can speak to them in much more detail than I. I just simply give a, a, a quick statement to highlight the richness of that material as well. North Samut has many imported Aegean amphora, and their dating, along with other aspects of the assemblage which Jean-Pierre has, uh, has studied, uh, suggest a very short occupation, perhaps 15 or 20 years. Is that your current thinking? Yeah. Smaller, even. OK, it gets smaller every time we discuss it. Uh, so a short, very short occupation, uh, sometime in the last quarter of the, uh, the fourth century BC. But of course, that could change, too, so we can talk about that more. This is all sort of still in, in process. Like North Samut, uh, Bir Samut had been extensively surveyed by several teams since the early 1990s, but no excavation had been undertaken. Uh, and I actually analyzed the surface material from the site collected by Steve and also by uh, Henry Wright and his team, which suggested a very intense period of occupation in the third and second centuries with some later, uh, sort of later fiddling around uh, shenanigans uh, later in the Roman period. But the nature of the site's use and any more specific sense of its chronology was, of course, lacking at that point. Now, the overall plan of the fort uh, was largely visible on the surface before excavation. Intact walls were clear in most areas, including this large, uh, of course, uh, almost square fortification with its three intact corner towers. Um, and if the excavation in 2015 and 16, and I give you both plans here, it's a very small 2016 plan, so I apologize for that. Um, these, uh, the excavations have revealed a series of, uh, of large rooms which were integral to the original construction of the fort, and then another series of more internal rooms uh, which, seem, which are not actually tied into the original architecture and post-date the original construction of the fort. So all of these areas, as well as two large middens uh, in the north and in the west, uh, have been the focus of excavation, and Pancher gave you a, a wonderful overview of that yesterday. So I needn't uh, spend time with that, except as it relates to the pottery assemblage from each of these parts of the fort. 
So the goals for the Samut pottery were, at the outset of the project, largely guided by the gaps which were left by the survey data. My primary goal was to refine our understanding of the chronology of the region broadly by developing a more nuanced sense of the assemblages which characterize each of the subphases that we saw in the survey. And the most not notable gap that we had, uh, which I've already mentioned, was this third to mid-second century uh, lump that we had in the middle, which was so important to us, but was so very difficult to, to, to divide. And this was clearly the most extensive uh, period of exploitation in the Eastern Desert, and Bir Samut from the beginning seemed like an ideal place to elaborate on, that, on the material characteristics of that phase. And as it turns out, it does that, and it does a lot more <laughs> than, than I would have hoped. So what I'm going to do now is offer you uh, something which is very much a preliminary uh, sort of snapshot of the work that's uh, ongoing. I mean, we just came out of the field for our last season in January. I don't even have the drawings yet from that season. Um, but I think nevertheless, in discussion with Mélangère and with Thomas and Jean-Pierre, as well as Ellen and Adam, we have begun to, to see at least a sequential kind of narrative emerging. And the pottery uh, fits into that very nicely. Uh, and as I think you'll see, uh, we have not solved the problem of the third century gap, but I think we have a lot to say about it now. So these are the broad phases which uh, I have been able to identify thus far in the Bir Samut material. The first phase uh, is so-called pre-fort phase, uh, although I'm not sure that's the, the name we'll end up with, uh, as it was in the field. This is how we, how we characterize it. Likely falling sometime in the early third century BC, and I'll say more about each of these phases quite briefly. Uh, see, it certainly predates the current standing fort, uh, and it's possibly associated with an earlier in installation at the site, almost certainly. Our second phase is our construction levels, which are associated with the standing fort, um, possibly again sometime in the first half of the third century BC. Uh, and this, these dates are again under discussion. A third phase, which is the main period of the fort's occupation. The duration and intensity of that, uh, I'll say a bit more about in a moment, sometime in the mid third, uh, a period of extended time. And then we have the abandonment phases. Uh, and these I see two from the point of view of the pottery. Um, the abandonment of the Ptolemaic occupation of the fort happens sometime in the last quarter of the third century BC. Um, the, that's phase 4a. And then at the turn, I would say, of the second century, the end of the third, and then turning into the second century BC, I think it's possible that we have a very brief uh, fluorescence uh, in, at the fort, the very last moments of uh, Ptolemaic occupation. And we can certainly see that in the pottery, that some areas of the fort are going out of use before others. And there are some real strong indicators of this turn into the second century in certain places. And then our fifth phase is a Roman reoccupation of certain rooms of the fort and uh, in areas which belongs in the second to third, possibly as late as the fourth uh, century CE. So those are the broad phases. So let me just say a little bit about these uh, in the time of the 10 minutes that I've got left. Um, <clears throat> the pre-fort occupation uh, is likely, certainly I would say after the occupation of Samut North, which we think is sometime in the late 4th century, but it's most, it is almost, it is without a doubt uh, predating the standing fort, and it certainly predates uh, all of the material in the middens, so sometime again maybe early in the 3rd century BC. Where does it appear? It appears in lower levels in rooms 12, 14, and 15 in the southeastern corner of the fort. And its characteristics broadly, and again, I don't have a lot to show you because this showed up in January, so I don't even have the drawings. Uh, it shows the material, the corpus, shows some influence of Greek forms and fabric types, but most of the main types, the common types from the middens, are not present. Um, it's as defined, it's a, a, a corpus defined as much by the absence of certain things as it is by their presence. There are no Egyptian amphora. None. No Egyptian type 1 amphora. So this is before that tradition has begun. Uh, we have many transport kegs, including the Oasis fabrics, which is interesting. Uh, and we have many imported Aegean amphora from uh, Kos, uh, from Rhodes, from Knidos, a number uh, of uh, unidentified types, which I'm still working on. Um, we have craters with rolled rims, mortaria, uh, distinctive round bottom jars in very unusual uh, fabrics, which marl fabrics, which are very gritty, which look a lot more like a late period fabric than anything else. But we have terra nigra, we have incurved rim bowls and terra nigra from this group. And we have some very interesting uh, imitations of Greek forms, in, including a very distinctive well-preserved cauldron. Uh, and these patera style bowls, which are also, uh, I think, riffing on, a, on an achaemenid type, essentially, um, which, is, which is very interesting. So it's a very notably 
totally different group than the Samut uh, North assemblage. And this is one of our complete, but almost complete vessels, which came from this pre-fort group in January. Uh, and this, is, this has its parallels. This kind of ledge rim jug has its parallels in early third century BC contexts from the Nile Valley, particularly in Karnak. Our second phase uh, dates to the fort construction. This is poorly dated, I'll be the first to admit. It's simply sequential at this point, and we'll have more to say about it in the future, I have no doubt. But I think it belongs in our, the first half of the third century. Um, it's poorly preserved generally. We have it only in rooms along the northern half of the fort, and it's ephemeral in these contexts even. These are very thin deposits, which are clearly associated possibly with the people who are there uh, constructing the fort, or certainly um, the very first generation. And they, they were very clean. They were annoyingly clean at Samut. They cleaned their rooms too often. So we just don't have a lot of stratigraphy building up in the rooms, unfortunately. And so this phase is a little bit more obscure. But it does contain Ptolemaic type 1 amphora in significant quantities quantities. We have denoi and crater forms, which show clear Greek influence. So we're starting to see this engagement with a broader Hellenistic koine in this phase. Uh, but we still have some of these late period jars uh, and late period types, which are also present at Samud North. So there's a kind of overlap here in the phasing. Now, this uh, material appears in the middens in particular and in these rooms along the north. Um, this is just to show you again what Berger has already showed you, the depth and complexity of these middens, uh, which are located in the north and in the western. The north midden is the older midden. Uh, the west midden is the one that is uh, abandoned last. It's the last one in use at Samut. So the material from the bottom of the north midden, the stratigraphy in the north midden and what's underneath it, is where we see this phase, this uh, uh, fort construction phase in the middens. And again, we have it in a couple of the rooms. So, uh, so it is there but it is, it is small in comparison to the material. And this is what some of it looks like. So we have some of these imported amphora, uh, we have some of these late period jar forms, uh, and these very simple uh, bowl forms, which are clearly the early third century uh, and associated with that assemblage in the Nile Valley. Now, our third phase uh, is the occupation of, this, of the standing fort before the abandonment. Um, mid third century BC is my current uh, hypothesis at the moment. Um, how long does this phase last? Is it continuous? Is it episodic? I don't know. <laughs> this is something we'll be discussing and working on. Where is it located? It's, it's only in the middens at the most, uh, for the most part. Again, very clean. So all of this intense activity and occupation, the longest phase of the site's use, is in the dumps. So the dumps are critical for understanding that. Um, we have in the dumps only this Ptolemaic type 1 amphora in the relevant midden levels. We have a fully developed corpus of early Hellenistic types with best, its best parallels from Comptos, Elephantini, and Edfu in terms of the forms and fabrics. Uh, and we have a full range of functional types. So the survey turned up no cooking pottery. We have cooking vessels coming out of our ears. Uh, we have everything, including perfume vessels, very specialized uh, material. And we also have something that I'd like to show, which I think is pretty exciting stuff. Here's, that's not it, that's not the exciting stuff. This is the, the kind of our standard uh, keg forms, the craters, the denoi, uh, jars, bowls, and things of that nature. It's this. Uh, this also comes from this phase, uh, from the Ptolemaic Midden. These are examples from the West Midden, uh, and also from the phases, related phases in the West Midden. We're tentatively calling this material Ptolemaic Eastern Desert Ware, for lack of a better term for what it is. It is uh, a handmade ware. It's a very interesting material. It's smoke-fired at a low temperature. Uh, it appears to be a marl, although we've got to do some kind of uh, petrographic analysis to figure out what this is. It's consistently a series of, uh, of shallow bowls. This is the best preserved examples that we have. We have no complete examples of these, but we have uh, upwards of uh, 15 to 18 uh, different vessels represented in the middens. We have one bottle, and you see the, the drawing there, which is a handmade bottle, uh, bottle finish, uh, which is undecorated. But the, the bowls are all consistently decorated with this incised hat pattern along the rim. Uh, it's burnished, pattern burnished, uh, along the body shirts. So this has its closest connection in material that is, uh, of course, associated with a much later phase uh, of work in the, uh, of activity in the region, uh, but it certainly shows a lot of morphological characteristics with uh, the so-called Eastern Desert Ware, and again, that's what we're calling it at the moment. But we'll continue to think about what that might represent. Now, just very briefly, the last phases are the abandonment of the fort. Um, this is happening sometime in the last quarter of the third century BC, and that's based on coin evidence and the Rodian, and a Rhodian amphora stamp, which was found in 2016, uh, which provides a terminus post quem. Where is it? It's everywhere. 
uh, they, went, they left the fort in a hurry, and it's good that they did, because they left behind complete assemblages in most of the rooms. Uh, and the characteristics of this is that a fully developed complex assemblage of a range of functional forms and types, again, only including Ptolemaic type and amphora, and with some new, uh, new types. So here's one of our, here's our stamped amphora handle from one of the floors. Uh, and then, just as an example, a room which Manger has already briefly showed you, uh, room 25, located on the western on the western side of the fort, which includes a very complex and uh, exciting assemblage of material, which you see here, uh, which it, it suggests perhaps a storeroom. Its functional sort of functional designation of that room is is a little bit unclear to me because we have everything from inkwells to perfume vials and amphora and everything in between, including a lot of very Hellenized forms, lekithoi, um, and various kinds of uh, various kinds of jars, which are closely tied to types which we would. I think broadly characterized as Aegean, uh, and then some very conservative Egyptian forms, late period forms, uh, which uh, seem to show continuity into this, this phase as well. We also have coins. Again, Tomas, the man to talk to about these, but these were also part of this assemblage, which helped us anchor it in the last part of the third century. Now, the last phase, and this uh, before I conclude, is the abandonment of the fort, uh, the second phase of that, which we, we turn the corner into the second century, we see the introduction of a few examples of Ptolemaic type II amphora in some of the rooms, a small number of examples uh, in the southeastern corner of the fort. So we have maybe six Ptolemaic type II amphora, which really can be associated with this very last moment in the third century into the second. And we also have these. Uh, and this is a, uh, a cook pot. This is the most complete example. We have uh, four of five of them now, or five handles, so I think probably four, four vessels. Uh, a handmade, handmade burnished cooking pot with high looping handles, also probably in marl. Uh, this is not a standard type. This is a new type, just like our handmade bowls, and represents a, a, a sort of insight, I think, that we didn't expect into uh, a different pottery tradition uh, is present in Samut Fort. And again, it has its closest parallels in Arabian pottery uh, and in Nubian pottery. So this represents the material culture of some different, uh, different ethnic group, which is involved in some way in the commerce at, uh, and, and food preparation at, uh, at Bir Samut. So for further, further work, we wait uh, to, to sort out what that might mean. And then lastly, our Roman reoccupation, which I include just simply for the interest and connection to these indigenous vessels. We have a second to third century CE reoccupation of certain parts of the fort, mainly in the bath and in the cistern areas and in um, certain parts of the interior of the fort. It's a very limited reoccupation, which has a set of uh, material profiles which are all uh, of a piece with, with the material documented along this road and in the north. And interestingly, um, some more indigenous uh, pottery. We have uh, from the bath area in one of these Roman contexts, a Roman, a complete Roman Eastern desert ware vessel uh, upside down. You can see it here in C2, sitting on the ledge of one of the tubs which had been opened up and cleaned out uh, for reuse in the Roman period. So uh, to sum, uh, so conclude, our work at Bir Samut is already revealing an exciting new range of contextualized material that spans that hundred years, which was missing or ambiguous from the surveys. The wide range of uh, types which are present in these deposits and the unprecedented variety of functional forms makes these assemblages an important new contribution, particularly since they've been found in association with datable Ostraka and coins. We have, which we can use, albeit cautiously, to provide an approximate framework for dating these assemblages more precisely. We can also begin to see emerging from this data evidence of a range of cultural connections expressed in the forms and wares present in the fort and in the middens. Nubian and upper Egyptian forms were used in, alongside Egyptian-made implantations of Greek types, Askoi, Ungrataria, Amphoriskoi, which is giving visual form, I think, to the hybrid nature of Egyptian society in this area in, and in this era. So taken along with the survey data and new work at Berenike, which we'll hear more about later today, uh, I think we're beginning to have a much clearer picture of the material contours of this region in the Ptolemaic period. Thank you.